We think because we read it and underline it in the Bible that we've got it. But we don't have it until it's tested and we can pass those tests and have a godly attitude, a stable godly attitude no matter what's going on in our lives. Now see, I know that the Israelites had heart problems. <laughs> they had stinky stuff in their heart. They had proud hearts. They had presumptuous hearts. They had impatient hearts. They got easily discouraged. They couldn't take very much. And so they had to make these trips around and around and around the wilderness while God was trying to work the bad attitude out of them. The sad thing is, the very sad thing is, is that out of a few million Israelites that came out of Egypt, only two people of the original group entered the promised land. I still just go. But I think that we can look at that percentage and say, gee, I wonder how many Christians ever really make it to the promised land. You know, it's different to live in the promised land than it is to talk about it all the time. And I got to the point several years ago, about 15 years ago, where I was tired of hearing somebody preach to me about the promised land. I wanted to live in the promised land. And I got personally serious with God and said, whatever it takes, I am not going to live upset. I am not going to live without peace. I will learn to enjoy every single day of my life. That is exactly why we call the television program Enjoying Everyday Life. If you cannot enjoy your simple everyday life, then what's it all about? If all we're going to do is get up every day and be angry and be mad and everybody that comes against us, we're going to get bitter and resentful and unforgiving and we're going to have a hard time with people that are not easy to get along with. I mean, the devil's never going to run out of stuff to upset us. You got to stop expecting all your circumstances to change and say, God, change me. Come on. This is a transition point for the believer. This is a turning point for the believer when we realize that God is actually using those circumstances that we want to change to change us. And that when God is finished with the circumstance and it's done the work in us that it needs to do, then He will change it. Now, I'm not saying they're all right. I'm not saying they're all fair. I'm not even saying they're from God. But I am saying that God will use them. That's how He gets good out of evil. All things work together far good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Joseph told his brothers, what you meant for harm, God intended for my good. And one of the ways that God gets good out of bad things is by using them to make you spiritually stronger so the next time the devil can't handle you quite so easy. Amen. Numbers 21, 4 and 5. And they, they being the Israelites, when they were out in the wilderness, journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, <laughs> depressed, much discouraged because of their trials. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Here comes the blame game, the murmuring, the grumbling, the complaining. Why have you brought us out of Egypt just so we can die in the wilderness? We have no bread, we don't have any water, and we hate this manna, <laughs> this miracle of manna. We hate the fact that you are raining down our food out of the sky every day. We just hate that, God, we're tired of that. They had a heart problem, amen? amen. They were greedy, grumpy, grouchy, impatient, never satisfied no matter what God did. And when a person is like that, they cannot do anything but wander around and around and around in the wilderness until they finally say, you know what? This is a test and I'm going to pass it. Come on, amen. Now, 
James 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2, Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort, or you fall into various temptations. There's not too many people there yet. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith bring out, everybody say bring out, yeah. endurance and steadfastness and patience. Well, eventually it does. <laughs> but it takes a while. And when you're born again, when you receive Christ, all the fruit of the Spirit is planted in your spirit as seed. And God wants to water that seed with His Word and then those things to grow up like giant fruit trees and be seen in your life. So God works with us to bring out in the open what He has put in us, but there's a problem. We have things clogged up in our soul that get in the way. You're a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Your spirit is the deepest part of your being. And for what's in your spirit to get out through your body and where it can benefit the world, it has to come through your soul, which has to be crucified. <laughs> you with me? Now, I actually can say that I'm a pretty patient person now. And I was so impatient. And so I would get trials and I'd read this be holy joyful thing. <laughs> and I hated them. It's like, who in their right mind could be happy when they get a trial? Because I didn't understand what they did for me. I didn't understand that those trials were bringing junk out of me that I needed to see because I thought more highly of myself than I should have. You see, we think because we read it and underline it in the Bible that we've got it. But we don't have it until it's tested and we can pass those tests and have a godly attitude, a stable godly attitude no matter what's going on in our lives. We need to hear this message once a week for about 25 years. And I'll just tell you now, in a way I almost feel sorry for you because I know that being in here now you are going to get a test. Yeah, let's have somebody be happy about it. See, that don't bother Dave because he already knows he'll pass the test. When I said that, that doesn't bother anybody that understands this and already knows that you've got practice at staying stable while you watch the devil wear himself out. Amen? That's why I've adopted my new phrase, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. And next year, I'll still be here. And the year after that, I'll still be here. Because I have made my mind up that greater is he that's in me. And I know the devil's going to come against me. I know he hates me. I know he hates what I'm doing. But I also know that he's not more powerful than my God. And I know that God is my vindicator and God is my defense. Amen? So we got around to patience, but let me tell you something. These trials brought a whole lot of stuff out of me before we got to patience. I mean fits and anger and complaining and murmuring and grumbling. And you know what? <laughs> Finally, I just got fed up with myself. Come on, is there anybody here you're just like fed up with yourself? You're just like, I just cannot stand acting like this anymore. I'm tired of being a yo-yo up and down and letting the devil control me. I'm tired of murmuring and grumbling and sitting around in self-pity while there's a beautiful life out there to live. And when you get really fed up with yourself, then you'll say, I'm ready to change. Whatever it takes, God, tie me to the altar and pour it on because I don't want to be like this this time next year. Amen? James 1, 12 through 14. 
Blessed, happy to be envied is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let me tell you something. On the other side of tests, there is promotion. On the other side of test, there is reward. And if you're going through something difficult right now, if you can get the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit activated in your life, and you can be stable, keep a good confession, on the other side of it, there is a promotion for you. Amen? Now, we have all kinds of tests, different tests. For example, the trust test is one of the tests that we must pass. And that means that we need to trust God when we don't have a clue what's going on. And it just doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't seem fair, and it doesn't hurt, and we can't even really get it to fit into the Word of God. And we say, you know, God, I don't understand it all. It hurts so bad I could just croak, but I trust you. I trust you. Every time you're tempted to complain, instead, just say out loud, nice and loud, God, I trust you. I trust you. It's like a sword going right into the devil when you do that. Because he wants you to sit around somewhere and say, I just don't understand. This just doesn't seem right. I just can't figure this out. I don't understand. Call up all your friends. Can you figure this out? I don't understand. <laughs> you're wasting your time. They don't even know what they're doing, let alone what you're doing. Don't run to the phone, run to the throne. I saw an example the other day of little faith, faith versus big faith. I don't know if you know anything about boats or being out on the water in a boat, but the smaller the boat, the more the waves affect you. And if you're in a small boat and it's a busy day on the lake, it's just really an unpleasant ride because the boat is just, you just feel like you've been beat to death by the time you get back. And, but if you, get a, if you have a bigger boat, the bigger the boat, the less you feel those waves. And God was just speaking to my heart, the bigger your faith is, the less you feel the waves of life. And I will tell you the honest truth, because I've grown over the years, and it's not that I don't have a long way to go, because I do. But thank God I'm growing. And I'm celebrating my progress. I'm not mourning over how far I have to go. I'm celebrating my progress. And you need to do that. Because if you'll celebrate your progress, it will give you the strength to get to the next level. And my faith has grown over the years, and it's still growing. And there are so many things that used to just upset me and aggravate me and get me fearful and worried that I'm just like, I ain't trying to figure that out. David said he did not get into things that were too wonderful for him. Let me tell you something. If we could figure everything out, we wouldn't need God. He knows what we don't know, and we need to be satisfied to know the one who knows even when we don't know what he's doing. Everybody say, I trust you. I need a bigger boat. <laughs> Why do you think that God gave the Israelites manna one day at a time? Why didn't He give them a month's worth at a time? Why not a week's worth at a time? There's a wonderful message there that that's the way God deals with His people. He gives us grace and provision one day at a time. And He wants us to enjoy what He gives us today and not worry about where tomorrow's provision is coming from. Amen? So many different kinds of tests. What about the Judas kiss test? <laughs> Say, huh? Have you ever been betrayed by somebody that you loved and trusted? You know, I actually believe that this is one of the tests that most of us will have to go through it sometime in life. And I believe, especially people that are going to be leaders in the body of Christ, you can just be pretty much assured that at some point, 
you're going to have somebody that you really loved and trusted just shock you. Somebody that you trust is going to tell your secrets that you thought they wouldn't tell. Somebody that you thought would never talk about you behind your back is going to judge you and criticize you. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to tell you that there are some things that Jesus bore for us, but there were some things that he went through to show us how to go through them. Are you out there? For example, Jesus was rejected. Well, I went through a lot of rejection. When I answered the call of God on my life, I lost my friends and many of our family members turned against us. I mean, everybody thought that I was the town nut. I mean, really, in, in the circles that we were in, women didn't do this. They just didn't do this. And I mean, I was looked at like the renegade nut. And people just didn't want anything to do with me. And the, the pain of rejection, I was rejected by my dad. The pain of rejection is horrible. That's a horrible pain. But Satan uses that against people to keep them from going forward. And I can, I can look back at my life and I can see every time God was going to promote me to the next level of my ministry. And you know, you never start where you're going to end up. I taught a home Bible study for five years. <laughs> Then I went to work at a church, and I got a little promotion. Then after a while, I was made one of the pastors there, and that was another promotion. And then after a while longer, God put me in my own ministry, and I felt like I'd had a demotion for a long time. <laughs> Sometimes you got to go down before you go up again. And then God let me go on television, and then He let me go on daily television. But at each one of those levels, I experienced a major attack of rejection from the people in my life, not my family, but people in my life that I loved and wanted their acceptance and approval. And I had to learn, and you will have to learn, that although we would like for people to applaud for us and be for us, we can live without it. Amen. And not only that, the Bible says that the cornerstone, which the builders rejected, and is talking about Jesus, has now become the chief cornerstone. They rejected Jesus, and now He is seated at the right hand of God, ruling over heaven and earth. And you may be rejected, but God can make you the chief cornerstone if you keep your eyes on Him. He told the disciples when, when they went out to preach. He said, if you go into a town and they reject you, here's what he said to do. Shake the dust off your feet and go on to the next town. So we need to learn a whole lot more of this. Amen? You're going to have to pass those tests. You're going to have to get to the point where when somebody judges you and criticizes you and rejects you and you don't get invited to the party and you don't get invited to lunch and you're the one at work that even though you're trying to do what's right for God, everybody treats you like you've got the plague, you need to say, that's okay, God, I've got you. And I know my day will come. If I remain stable and don't compromise to have something this world has to offer, my day will come. Shake it off and go on. The Judas kiss test, I think it's the hardest. Why do I call it the Judas kiss test? Because Jesus passed this test. If you read the scriptures surrounding the way that Judas behaved, you just want to strangle him. He betrayed Jesus with a kiss of all things. When they sat at the Last Supper and Jesus said, someone is going to betray you, Judas said, well, surely, Lord, it is not I. You phony. <laughs> you lying phony. He had already made a deal with the Pharisees to sell Jesus out. He was greedy. But you know what? Jesus passed the test. You know how I know he did? Because he went ahead and did the will of God. He went ahead with God's plan. He finished his race. He went to the cross. And because he didn't let rejection stop him, he didn't let misunderstanding stop him. 
He didn't let the Judas kiss stop him. We are here today. And if you don't let the devil stop you, there will be somebody praising God in the future because of your witness and your testimony. Amen? Say, I'm going to pass my test. There's so many different kinds of tests. The forgiveness test, we're going to talk about that a whole lot more tomorrow. Loving the unlovely test. Oh, God, help me walk in love. <laughs> oh, honey, you just ask for it. You just ask for it. My daughter called me one day three or four years ago, and she'd been having trouble with a certain person. I mean, this person was just about to drive her up the wall. And she said, I have been so mad and so upset and just thinking about getting this person out of my life, and I'm not going to put up with you anymore, and blah, 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 blah. And she said, then God reminded me that I had prayed that I could love everybody. Come on, we pray these prayers that are so spiritual sounding. Oh God, I surrender all. I love you, Lord. Take my life and do what you will with me. <laughs> Your will be done, oh God, and not mine. Teach me to love. <laughs> he says, oh. <laughs> yeah. We all have people in our life that we would like to strangle. <laughs> and as soon as they go away, somebody will move in next door to you that's <laughs> even worse. Amen? Amen? The time test is another test. Gosh, it takes God so long <laughs> to do some things. Why, God, why? When, God, when? You don't even have to get off the throne to do this. Just look in my direction. One little teeny tiny miracle. I mean, come on, God. Why are you making me go through this? <laughs> it's a test. <laughs> it's a test, a test, a test, a test. Because we love to quote it, oh God, my times are in your hands. <laughs> Come on. Oh yes, God. <laughs> my times are in your hands, Psalm 31, 14, and 15. <laughs> oh man, the discouragement test, frustration test, <laughs> the self-will test, the wilderness test, the loneliness test, the test, the test, the test, the test, the test. But as I said earlier, there's one thing that's important to you, and I want you to remember this. You may get tested trying to get out of the parking lot tonight. <laughs> Somebody that's got their car plastered with bumper stickers may try to run all over you. <laughs> and you can't say, what about the love walk? Amen? It's possible that you could go out to the resource table and trying to buy yourself a book or some CDs and somebody could just almost knock you down trying to get theirs. You want to just go. But instead you can say, it's a test. It's a test. Joyce told me it was going to be a test. And I have one goal in mind from now on in my life, pass the test. I'm going to pass the test. If I can just pass the test. Amen? And I will tell you, when you begin to pass those tests, you won't get as many of them. And even if you do, you won't even notice them that much. Doesn't bother me now if we don't have a stopper in the hotel room. I just get mine out. Come on, it's time for us to grow up. Say, I'm going to pass my test. Amen. Why don't you all stand up?
you know, every trial and test that God allows us to go through will work out for our good, especially if we keep the right attitude. And it's intended to increase our faith in Him. God uses these things to refine us. How we behave in these times of pressure is really the most important thing. And it's the true test as to whether or not we pass or not. So no matter what the trial is, you can say, yet I will rejoice. You may not feel like it, but you can do it in faith, believing that no matter what it is, it will work out for your good. And you know, whatever you might be going through right now today, I want you to believe that. Whatever it is that you're facing, if you keep a good attitude, you keep your faith in God, it will work out for good. Women in Albania are taught to be silent and not to speak out. This is something that has come from long past ago. And although many organizations uh, do advocate and do encourage women to bring it out and to um, tell the truth, it's something that has to do with the culture. If something happens to you, it's a shame factor. For some women, the Christian church is becoming a refuge, a place where they can speak freely However, less than 2% of the population are Christian, and most of them have no spiritual mothers or fathers. What I'm facing, I cannot share with my parents. They are not Christians. What I'm facing, I cannot, I do not have an adult Christian to talk to and say, is this normal, what is happening to me? Or how can I face this difficulty? A counsel is something that we lack. The first generation has just to experience everything, good or bad. And this spiritual mother for people, it's for, for the ladies and for the women, it's very important because it's somebody saying, I've gone through this way. It's painful, but you're gonna make it. And this is what Joyce has been transmitting to us and giving us power to go forward. Even though there are hard times in our life, even though not everything is perfect, but we know that somebody else went through the same road, the same pain, and she made it. So we're going to make it as well. Ik heb gelijk. Die ander heeft het fout. Eén woord te veel en je hebt een knallende ruzie. En niemand heeft het gedeeld. Het kan ook anders. En ontdek nu hoe. Nu verkrijgbaar van Joyce Meyer. Leven zonder conflicten. Bestel nu het boek Leven zonder conflicten. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Alle boeken van Joyce Meyer staan overzichtelijk op een rijtje in een brochure. Geef nieuwe impulsen aan je dagelijks leven en bestel deze gratis brochure nu telefonisch op nummer 026 20 22 100.